I am so excited for this conversation with one of my favorite humans in the world and also the executive vice president of network funding, Rich Jefferson. Thanks for joining me, man. Hey, I'm glad to be here, KP. It's always good to be on these with you. Oh, dude, I love I love that I have so many friends that are willing to get on a, a video uh, or audio podcast style thing without having any clue what I want to ask them. So um, that is really fun for me and, and says a lot about how much trust I have out there. So, dude, thanks. Uh, man, thanks for spending time. Yeah. You, uh, you, we, I'm trying to remember where we met. It was when we rolled out your... Uh, the coop into your coop company. probably I, 2015 maybe yeah i think that's when it was and i had heard about this rich jefferson and the only you know richard jefferson i had known since you know being an nba guy is is the basketball player so i was like i gotta meet this guy is it the same one and, and very much not very much yeah. not i one. almost it, crazy side note i almost clipped richard jefferson on speedway in <laughs> tucson as he was walking across the street <laughs> to go to the gym. Oh my Can you imagine God. that, that news? <laughs> Rich <laughs> Jefferson runs over Rich Jefferson and all your family would be like, which one, which one was the driver and which one was yeah, one? Exactly. Oh, That's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. So, uh, so did you, you and I, um, I've connected with you so well over time. And, and I remember during the pandemic reaching out and checking in and we're part of a bigger mastermind group that I've talked about, you know, one of those skills for getting from here to there during difficult times is having the right, the right people on your team. And I've, I've done a lot of, of speaking on that on like, you know, how do you make sure that you have the right people by your side? You've been one of those people for me. Um, and so first off, I just want to say thank you for helping me get through the toughest period of my life. Hey, you helped me too. I mean, that was the gem. You know, we were all wondering what the heck and so it, it was great to get with some trusted people to find out hey man it's it's not just me you know we're, you know we carry the burden for a lot of people right i mean we have companies and and people want answers people want to hear what's happening and sometimes you just don't know and that's a struggle for me i always like to be the guy that knows i try hard i educate myself like I do a lot of research to understand uh, what's happening. And there was a period, there was, there was probably three months, I would say late March through June, where, man, it was a struggle. It's a struggle for me. I love that you have said you that. guys. It feels like I'm the only one who doesn't know. And like, that's really the hardest part for me, especially like in this market right now, when people are like, what's the plan? And I'm like, <laughs> like, we're putting one together, but like, I'm going to need other people who are better than me sometimes to help me figure this stuff out. Because as a leader, you, you want to provide the answers, right? Like yeah. that's what they look to you for. Yeah. I mean, those are the, as leaders, I mean, we, you know, we, our main jobs are to influence, you know, behaviors, decisions, and outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. So how am I to lead when I don't know what the heck is going on? Like, that's where I struggled. It was a real struggle for me. Yeah. Yeah. And when you have people on, on, you know, different with different perspectives and different, like one of my favorite quotes is we're all in the same storm, but we're on different boats. And, uh, and, and knowing that, like, how do I speak and influence everybody not knowing where each person is with something and knowing that, you know, you could get, uh, some real negative feedback if you say the wrong thing or people, you know, confuse your intentions or where you're just trying to hang in there. And it's like, oh, this is not easy. Yeah, it's not. And, you know, I, I've been using video a lot for a lot of years. I started back in 2008 uh, using video. So it was one of the things that my coach, Bill Hart at the time, I only wanted Bill to help me market because we could talk about this later, but that was a, a big year for me. Never mind the stuff going on in the industry. I was in a transition, so I needed to market myself and he just kept pushing me towards video. So if I'd set my iPhone up and, and send a message out to all of my referral partners and clients. And so it started then. So when COVID hit, you know, obviously everybody's at home. So I use video to, you know, address all the tough subjects, right? I mean, we are a business. There were certain rules and there's certain 
uh, expectations. And it was hard because COVID ended up being a 50, 50 thing, right? Either you believed it or you didn't. And, (laughs) and it was rough. So I felt like video helped me get my message across better because they could see my emotion. They could see whether I really cared about something. You just see that stuff. You hear it in the inflection of my voice and my crazy scrunchy faces I make when I say certain things. So that was difficult. It was really difficult. I went out there. I was pretty vulnerable. I had certain positions, but I didn't pressure. Um, I acknowledged others' positions, and I just asked that we all respect each other. That's it. And, you know, it got some hate mail um, from people that just didn't understand or listen to the context in, in which I was delivering it. But, man, emotions were high. It was a tough time. Yeah, I love that, that you're already kicking in with you did it, right? You you brought back one of the skills you had learned way earlier. So this whole lessons from last time concept is how do we implement things that worked last time and 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 bring those things to like solve the problems we face today? You mentioned back in 08 is when you started. Let's go back there for a second because I didn't know you coached for with Bill for that long. Like yeah. Bill was my coach well, I too. fired him. Oh, good. All right. I did fire him for about uh, two years. <laughs> I He's thought on the I knew podcast everything soon, so point. I'll chat with him about that. Uh, I'll bring it up and be like, how much impact did that have when he got fired by Rich? He did have to, he made me beg when I wanted to get him back. So, oh, that's awesome. When <laughs> did I he stop with did. that? Yeah. So, well, that was a tough time. I, you know, I've been in the mortgage business uh, mostly since 1990. Wow. Um, I took a, a about a four year break and I sold tech, which was cool and fun. Uh, but of course, the mortgage business just drags you back. But I funded my first loan when I was 18 years old. I didn't know anything. My mom owned a brokerage and uh, I owed her some money. I racked up a Texaco <laughs> gas card and <laughs> and she got pretty pissed off at me and uh, made me go to work and bought me a white shirt and a nice tie and dropped me off. In Ontario, California, there was a certain road that had just a ton of banks. And she dropped me off at one end and she said, I'll meet you back here in two hours. You can hit all these banks. Just walk and walk in and say to the bank loan officer that you can do anything they cannot to give you a try. Mm -hmm. And I came back with a loan and I funded that loan within 45 days and I was hooked. Like it was a great business, but you know, things happen years go by and, and, uh, I got into wholesale. I was working a ton. And one of my buddies who was in wholesale said, Rich, you'd be great in wholesale. And I was like, I need a change. So I got into wholesale and that was successful and fun. Um, they relocate my company, relocated me to Scottsdale, Arizona in July of 2006. Oh no, did you buy a house? Buy a giant (laughs) Scottsdale home. Oh. (laughs) And uh and so it was, you know, I thought I was king of the world at that time, right? I mean, making good money. My kids were just born, and uh I have twin daughters, so they they were just born in October of 2005, and so there was a lot going on. Well, then my wholesale company shut down, and then I joined another one, and that one also shut down. So I just looked at my wife and said, Veronica, I, I'm going to originate. Like, I know I haven't funded a loan in 10 years, but I know how to do this. And this is what I'm going to do. This is how I know we can make money. So I just started from seven? nothing. Pardon? This is 2007? This is 2000. Uh, yeah, 2007. Wow. Yeah, probably, you know, February 2007. And she backed you. Yeah. Well, she's in the mortgage business too. She right. was at the time. And uh, so she just knew, you know, mm-hmm. she led, she led a bunch of people for AmeriQuest for a, for a long, long time, long before they were AmeriQuest. She was with the company for a long time, but so she understood. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we just got after it and started building referral partners and referral sources and started fresh. But that was a very vulnerable moment for me. You know, so, and I believe that's helped me today because right now, today, we're going through a period very similar to what I had to go through, you know, for 
18, 24 months, we had business falling from everywhere. And people didn't hone their skills and they just got kind of lazy and atrophied and they they weren't out there hustling. They didn't have to. They were working hard. It's just they weren't exercising their sales muscle much by getting out there and, and marketing yourself and earning business and that kind of thing. So that period for me allowed me to prove to myself, I can do this. And so within a short period of time, I built it to, you know, two and a half, three million a month for me at that time, the loan sizes weren't nearly as big as they are now, but um, I felt pretty successful, but then I got the itch to get back into leadership. And in that okay, be I, before you go there, I got to ask. So yeah. you said something that I've never thought about in this way. You compared working hard or you contrasted working hard from hustling. And I yeah. think it's hard for me to put that into, into words, but you just did it perfectly. So people who are working hard feel like they're hustling. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, well, I mean, we all are. This business is hard. If you're a career minded person pro in our business, it is very hard. You're at it 24 seven, it seems like. But uh, there is a difference between working hard and and out and hustling. And that the difference is to make it simple, you're dialing out instead of everybody else dialing into you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to go out and get it. And right now is that time. Um, you know, just like it was for me in 2007 and eight, when I didn't know anybody, I knew the realtor that sold me my house. That's it. And I started with her and she owed me a favor. So handshakes and lunch meetings and just built it up. And, and that's what our folks in the industry are having to do today. A lot of the referral partners are, they're all complaining about no inventory. Well, okay. But homes are still being sold and loans are still being done. I just need to go get somebody else's share. And yeah. so you have to have sales muscle to, to do that and get out there and you got to have the discipline to get it done every single day. So that's the difference between hard work and, and hustle. Mm -hmm. You're and you did it in Phoenix, which yeah. I yeah, it was Phoenix, a meltdown was city here. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went for a ride. I'll never forget. It was like, Oh, so I go seven or 08 and uh, I went to Phoenix, hung out with a buddy. We went to a, a son's game and the whole way there, it's him and these two realtors and me. And I'm listening to them talk about the market and just how far houses had dropped. And so completely different issue than we have right now, right? Yeah. Right now, housing is actually stable, fairly yeah. stable. Um, it's not chaotic Super one stable. way or the other. Yeah. Um, so a different issue. But the same amount of like, we had X amount of deals to close, and now we have X divided by five or call it 10. And so what do we do with that? How, how do you not let that get to you? Like you faced a really tough situation. How do you, was it that you were new and like scrappy? Like you, you, because you came out of wholesale and you're like, I wasn't I'm new not. and scrappy. I was successful at mortgages like actually getting out there hustling and stirring up business for myself before like i said it goes back to 1990 like i know how to do it that period of time was a it was a check for me are you really as confident as you seem and it, fortunately that drove that drove me hard like mm -hmm. i didn't want to come home and tell veronica i didn't i didn't find it a deal today, or I didn't get a new referral partner because we are accountability partners, right? We're just trying to build our family and, you know, our nest eggs. And so we are accountable to each other. So even today I walk, if I'm working from home, I walk outside of my office and I got to check in with Veronica. Like she wants to know what happened today. She wants to know so-and-so did, did they do this? And what about a business plan? Who's doing this and where are people going? And that kind of interaction that I have every night, sometimes at lunch, it helps me keep me in check. Like, oh yeah, got to do that. Well, that's a great idea. Cause sometimes that third party perspective also gives me an idea. She'll say, oh, well, have you thought about this? 
And it might be completely off topic, but I'll be like, ding, that's a great message to get out to my company. So, you know, I crazy really business that. we're in. That's, so when I, I have to share this with you. When I became a wholesale account executive up in the Northwest, I didn't know anybody in the Northwest. I didn't know anything. Uh, I was a, a loan officer, then a trainer down in California. So same as you, lived in California, moved to another area. And when I did it, um, Mindy was, uh, you know, we had we had just had our baby, I think at the time, uh, Tate had been born. And we sat down and she's like, okay, so you're going to go start at this end of the street, go to that end of the street. We got a, um, a Thomas guide. Yeah. And we basically found all the brokers we could and put them on the Thomas guide because this is 19 or it's 2000. And so I had a map of like my Northeast Portland group and then my Southeast Portland. So every day was a different area. And she printed these charts for like these spreadsheets because I hate spreadsheets. She printed them. She's like, go out, make notes, and then I'll transfer the notes to next week's spreadsheet with like to do's for next time and like all that stuff. She's the reason I was successful as an account executive because I wouldn't have done that. I without her accountability. And I I love that you brought that out. You need that accountability from somebody and having it at home in a way that isn't judgmental, but it's like, Hey, if we're going to crush this, I know that the two of us are better than one of us trying it. Mm -hmm. um, and not that Mindy needed to do the job, but I needed to know that when I came home, I, I, I needed to account for what I had done to help our family grow, uh, in a, in a difficult time. So I love that you have the same experience. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a partnership. So well, it doesn't work with every single relationship. Um, ours is unique. We're both in the business and she knows how to spell mortgage. And so that helps. Mm -hmm. um, but listen, you got to fall back on somebody and it's going to be your partner for sure. And uh, again, the accountability piece, like, for example, Bill Hart knew that he was coach number two because <laughs> coach number one already gave me some ideas and I'm just checking them on coach number two. So, and Bill knew he was coach number two. So it's just, it's just crazy. I love, I, I love Veronica. We have a great, great relationship. She's a, she's a salesperson. She allows me to like when I was originating, not too many partners allow you to get up from a movie in a movie theater to go out to the car to take an application. <laughs> no. Right. I mean, that's just the kind of things that we're, we're in a crazy business and those are the, we service customers. And sometimes you got to do that. And yeah. she understood that. So that helps. Okay. So from the time you launched your, your, you know, as a loan officer going back, you know, pounding the streets and making money that way to leadership, how long of a window was that for you to step into a leadership role? 2013. So I sold and took leadership positions within my company at the time. Uh, but they were in a, this is the previous company to network funding. They were in a period where they wanted to bring in executives from the FDIC world. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't that. And so I needed to find an opportunity where I could use my skill set at a, at a company that needs that kind of skill set. Network funding was a perfect fit for me. So, and I'd known them for a long time when I was in, you know, wholesale and in, in Houston, they were, cause I lived in Houston and I knew all the ownership. I knew everybody. So it was a very comfortable fit for me. And it was the perfect company to kind of start fresh with. And um, no, I'm glad. This is one of the best moves I've ever made in my life. So I'm pretty happy about it. So I love that. Um, and I love that you like decided that this was the place for you. Talk to me about values because where I'm kind of going through this, Mindy lives by her values and it's amazing. She's like, mm -hmm. well, I value this. So that's why I do it. And I'm like, I do all the things and I don't oftentimes sit and go, but yeah, but what do I value? Like what matters to me when you were deciding on moving from a company that you had worked for, uh, was it a values-based decision for you? Like I line up with this and this is where I want to be because of these things. Cause it doesn't sound like it was money. No, it, it definitely wasn't money. I took a step back. And because uh, that's always what happens with leadership. The salespeople should always make the most money. Uh -huh. um, but it was just the right move for me. And while it wasn't 100% value based, because I knew who I was working with. I mean, the values of our company are faith, family, home. I mean, that's we think about everything. You know, it was one of the first mortgage companies that I 
this is early that they promoted faith. Mm -hmm. You didn't see that much in our industry and we promote it on our website and how we make our decisions. And, you know, so that's a very important value in our company, but it, but it wasn't just that it was a company that I felt needed leadership to grow mm -hmm. like street leadership, you know, not ownership type. I'm talking about you get dirty, you get your hands dirty, you get into it, you help, you coach, you inspire those little things on a daily ba basis. And network funding at that time was a perfect fit for me. Yeah. And, I, and that was 2013 and you've been there ever since. 13, yeah. So from then to, and let's go back to, you know, getting through 2020, 2021, mm -hmm. you pulled back some of those video, you know, skills that you had, you started working through that. You're, you're being a leader in the company. Are there some things that you picked up that you're, that now you're like a way stronger leader because you learned some of those lessons back then? Sure. Um, back then I was impatient. I was cocky. Uh, you know, I was young and now I'm 50 and, uh, I I've experienced a lot more. I've seen more happen. I've made plenty of mistakes to learn from, you know, it, it was a good timing, like the video piece, like I had always done video. I just didn't do it on a consistent basis. Like I'm doing it now with my company. Um, I didn't, I did it as straight promotion before, whether I wanted to promote a product that we were launching, or if I wanted to make sure people were doing their compliance training and that kind of stuff. And it just evolved when I started getting requests, Rich, how would you, you know, do this? How would you talk about this? And these are in little coaching calls, little 10 minute calls that I have during the day with all of our people, you know, calling for, you know, they need help with a loan or a scenario, but they would, you know, ask me, how would you? So I just turned that into a daily video. So while some of my videos during the day are housekeeping items, making sure that people are doing what they should be doing. Uh, but a lot of it is, hey, I just learned something really cool from one of our people in Florida. I want to share it with the entire company. I think everybody can use this. And so that, it just grew. It just grew and um, people love it. it. And I've seen it. I mean, you're you're doing that in the Knowledge Cube. So I get to, I don't spy on you a ton, but like I, I get a notification and I see people and the, the value that they're getting out of those communications and just knowing that they're connected to you. Um, it's amazing relationship building. And I, and I, and I love seeing you kind of invest, but also the vulnerability you bring, you're mm -hmm. not trying to be somebody that they want to see. You're just trying to be you and it's worked out. And it, you, you also have a perfect environment for it because you shape that environment where like, they just expect you to be rich. Um, mm -hmm. do you find yourself ever being not vulnerable and catching yourself or is it just, you just flow that way? Oh, no, of course. I I catch myself. Um, and that that happened during COVID. Um, my messaging started to get a little more, you know, just bitter, I guess I would say. Like, I was frustrated. I was frustrated with so much. I was frustrated with internally all the complaints about everything. Mm -hmm. um, the turn times, you know, all of that stuff it was just a lot of pressure. And I, in turn, reflected that back to my people. And it it took me a couple of weeks to realize it. I, I think I think it might have been my my assistant who said, Rich, you you're out of sorts. You, you know, you're the inspiring part of your messages have been gone. Mm. Like she checked me. And I was like, you know what? You're right. She's like, you're not, you don't look like you're having fun. We see you. So don't forget <laughs> one thing when you're, you could put everything in an email and send it and maybe people read it differently, but if they see it, then, you know, the, the good stuff is better. The bad stuff is worse when yeah. you're viewing it. Yeah. So, you know, that I had to check myself during that period. And, and actually I wasn't checking myself. Kimberly checked me. So 
um, that was, and she's really good about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty open. Like I'm an emotional dude. Like, yeah, I've dropped tears on some of my videos, you know, talking about what's happening and where to go and how to do things. And like, I'm, I'm pretty emotional. So, you know, I think they like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that you have somebody that's willing to call you out. Like that's the, I mean, I sat on set with Sawyer. I recorded two hours today for some, um, something we're doing. And I sat down in a really good mood because I had been, I ran this morning, which is what I need to do if I want to be smiling on set. And so I came in hot, feeling great. Uh, last week I had a really rough day. We tried doing video and he looks at me, and goes, Hey, do you want to do this later? <laughs> and that's his subtle way of saying you're not in a good headspace because right. I don't think enough people realize that you can't really hide a lot of the feelings you have inside when you're doing a video, when you're in person, especially there's certain people that can look over and go, Oh, um, Rebecca does that to me in meetings mm -hmm. where she'll look over and be like, she knows exactly what I'm thinking and knows like how to direct a conversation to make sure that we, you know, keep the conversation really good and light, you know, if that's what we're looking for. Um, but you need those people to say that to you because otherwise you end up not realizing how you're being taken, you know, how people are, are receiving the message. And that's an older Rich Jefferson able to take that. Like a younger one would have been like, no, I'm fine. What are you talking about? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Screw you, you all. Know? You're not listening correctly. Yeah. Yeah. You're not hearing me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the older I've gotten, the more vulnerable I've, you know, I've been. Mm -hmm. And I, I accept that. Like, I'm not perfect. I mean, the other thing about these daily videos is they're one takes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not editing. I clip, you know, a little bit in the front and when I'm, you know, doing my hair and then I clip <laughs> the end. So it's some polished video, but they're getting, they're getting me as if I'm standing in front of them. That's the slurs, the mispronunciations, the mistakes you know all of it i just give it to them and if it's something major i'll correct it i'll put a little note on the on the video on the screen that says no he meant this that kind of thing but that's part of the fun too mm -hmm. you know i love it when the engagement is they're clowning me you know yeah that's and that is the kind of open leadership that i think allows people to speak to you like you know, they tell you how they're thinking. And that's the, like I mentioned up front, I mean, leadership, we, you know, anybody can manage numbers and do the management, that kind of stuff. But leadership requires a very open relationship with your employees. You, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to share and influence decisions that they're making and behaviors. Cause that's the only way we get the outcomes we expect. And you have to earn that. Yeah. And for, you know, for 10 years, I've been earning it with, with my people. And I continue to do that today. So. Yeah. Okay. I want to transition to one thing, kind of finishing off final thought, you know, question for you. Uh, because I have, you know, Tate, Aria, Avery, I've got my, my boy, girl, girl, and my girls are about the same age as your twins. Mm -hmm. And your twins are a little younger than, than my uh, girls, but um, going through that, that time, you know, the, I want to just specifically focus on 2020 and 2021. You're running a business, you're maintaining a marriage, and you've got daughters at one of the toughest ages of, I mean, every age the is freshman running. year. Yeah. During COVID. how do you, how did you manage that? And was it, how much strategy did you put into parenting during that time? Um, well, we did a lot more with the girls. We did, you know, obviously we, we were home, we were cooking more, mm -hmm. we we're baking more. I got into baking breads. And I remember that. Yeah. Things. You know, I was trying to keep myself busy and my mind, right. And that happened to be a good thing for me, but you know, I have two and they're two different people that handle things differently. One's very, uh, outgoing and she's a theater kid. She loves theater. Like they were doing zoom theater. Um, oh, wow. she took it the worst. I, I would say they both 
handled it okay. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't get that traditional freshman experience, right? Because they didn't get to go and wonder on campus, like, where's my f- first, you know, class? And uh, they didn't get that experience until later. But I think it was the, my, my theater kid, she, she really wanted to be there. She needed to be in front of people. She wanted to, this is her first year in high school theater and she didn't know anybody and you could only really get to know so many over zoom so much. Mm -hmm. And so she really needed to get out and, and, you know, be with people. She was towards the end. She was, she was like a cage tiger. She needed to be out. And the other one, she's studious and you know she she was fine i mean she got frustrated just to be on zoom all day for school but you know she was fine so the two different ways and we just had fun we did a lot of cooking a lot of dinners you know nice so in the end it was a it was a bonus like you got that time and i feel the same way like getting time once i got over myself and my own struggles and realized you know i wasn't going to get this time with them um, and it was, it, it ended up being a gift. That was really the the shift. And then I'm like, oh, cool. Let's, let's be best friends. Like, let's figure this out where relationship building happens that otherwise wouldn't have happened. So yeah, there's yeah. definitely some benefit there. That was great. They, they made it through They're tough girls, but you know, we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing it in schools we're seeing it in grades there. It yeah. was harder on people than we all know. Yeah. And, uh, we were just fortunate to get through pretty unscathed. Yeah. Well, dude, thanks for, thanks for being willing to talk about that. That's kind of a, you know, over and above kind of a thing, but um, I love what you've brought. I love like going back to the things that got you through last time, but also just that scrappiness of understanding the reality of the situation and you scrap and you're vulnerable and you're building team at the same time. And you're constantly leading. I think that's, it's, exhausting right now. And in what, what I'm experiencing is this is really hard work. And I, and I also think for any mortgage people listening, yeah. And sometimes it's really not like, sometimes we really benefit from things that are like over and above, like awesome. The market Mm -hmm. basically just feeds you leads and that's cool. Um, And so if you're going to be part of the mortgage industry, you have to be willing to, to go through all of these things. And then knowing we get through, like, we know the other side of this story, right? It's yeah. actually great. You got to just prep yourself during those tough times to flourish and grow during the good times. I mean, a lot of growth happens in bad times. In fact, some of the most important growth happens in bad times. It's, you know, how durable are you? What's your mindset like? Like that, all of that stuff is very enlightening and top of mind. It should be. Oftentimes it's not, but it should be. And you need good coaching, good people around you to remind you of that yep. because mindset can take you in completely different directions. And that's the thing that we're focusing on now is make check in our mindset. Like, where are we? Are we in a growth mindset? Are we fixed? And we're just going to be static. But, uh, you know, some good things are happening. We We learned a lot. I look at the past and those are, Listen, we can take in very important lessons from what we go through. And for me, having to start over made me a better mortgage person, but even a better leader too, because I did it at an age that, well, you know, 2007, I was in my mid thirties. So, you know, it was a, it was a pretty humbling age to kind of get out and start over again. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do that. And I'm thankful for that time period. So. Nice. When, and you, you mentioned having the right people around you and the right team and, and uh, going through the last couple of weeks, it's, it's been a struggle for me. Uh, and I've told a couple of people that like you, like friends in our, our small friend group. And every time I say that, they're like, Hey, why didn't you call me? Um, yeah. I was talking to Renee Rodriguez and I was like, he's like, how you doing? I'm like, been a tough couple of weeks. He's like, and yet you didn't call. And I'm like, uh, Sorry. Like, I think the default is to go into this. Nobody wants to hear what I'm going through. And I just have to struggle through it and like, you know, pound through. And in in actuality, we have people around us. Like once you've set up that team, it's, it's going, I have resources, like use the resources. You're not the only one. You're not different. Like we all, you know, it's that 
uh, I can do this on my own. You know, it's like mochismo. I can get through this on my own. And and oftentimes we end up kicking dirt for two weeks before we actually do reach out to somebody that can kind of guide you. Yeah. You know, no one's going to be able to tell you what to do, mm -hmm. but people, good friends and a good circle of, of friends, especially and if they're in the in the in the industry or in your business, that's always good. But it's most of my best advice comes from outside of the industry, because again, it's that third party perspective. They strip away. They don't even know all the nonsense. They're listening to you. Yeah. And that that's where the most important kind of guidance come from with my circle of friends in and outside of the network, uh, inside of the industry. So I cherish those relationships they are so important to me. And the importance uh, exploded during those COVID years. I didn't really understand the strength. You know, you and I have been, a, you know, a part of groups, uh, the master's coach together. And those are, you know, you go to those and like-minded professionals in our industry get together and they're vulnerable and they share their experiences. They share what's working, what's not working. I look forward to that. And during those COVID years, we didn't have that. So we were kind of patched it together and we were able to get to our group together and talk about, and those times really helped me a ton because I realized, no, it's not just me. <laughs> Once I realized that, life got a little bit easier. I was holding too much on me. And, you know, there were certain things I could not control, but I was trying to control it all. And I was frustrated. And just to hear from you guys and your perspectives and your challenges, I realized, okay, just take a breath, focus, get your mindset right, stay with your buddies, stay with your group of friends and just check in on each other. Dude, I'm I'm actually holding back tears right now. So, uh, um, what you just said, you're not different. I need to write that on a wall. Like I need that on my whiteboard at all times because I think I feel like I'm the only one sometimes. And you're right. Like that was the value of getting everybody together. It's like we're all dealing with the same thing, especially in the mortgage industry right now. Like you're not different. You know, we've all gone through tough times. We've all gone through struggles. But I think that's it. I think the the lie that I believe sometimes is, hey, I'm different than everybody else. They're all more successful than I am or they're not going through the same thing that I am. But in actuality, I can't imagine a time that I've been any different than everybody or that I'm not, you know, that I'm not getting through something that everybody else would be able to get through. You know, yeah. that's a huge, valuable lesson for me. Totally. Yeah, it's, you know, they they can take it to the negative and, and use it like, you know, that old saying misery loves company. Oh yeah. Totally. But that's not, that's not, I don't, I don't have friends like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's not this. It, your, your friend group should be inspiring. Your friend group should be, you know, they should be open to discuss their challenges and that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and that's, imp if you have the right group, man, it's, it's, it's just different. It makes life easier. So if you have a close group of friends in the, in and outside of the industry, you know, I used to call them mentors, they're friends really, yeah. and use them and be open and talk. And then you, you start to realize that, you know, we all struggle with the same. We're all just showing it differently. Mm -hmm. And once you realize and can see the signs, then you're able to support your, your friend circle. You're able to support the people you work with. You start to see those things in your own environment and it gives you a chance to understand. And that's the key is just to understand what somebody's going through because we all handle it differently. Mm -hmm. So Dude, I love it. And thank you yeah, for being man. part of that for me. Cause man, you were a big part of, uh, of my life over the last few years. And, and you've always been there when I've needed to talk and I've, I've tried to be there for you. And um, some of those are my, my favorite conversations. So, and, and thanks for sitting with me on this. I think that there's just a ton of value for people in listening to this and, and learning from the experiences you had um, and, and can go out there and be scrappy and be surrounded by the right people. So dude, I appreciate you. And, uh, and thanks. Hey man, it's always a good time to spend with you, Ken. Always. All right. See you, man. <laughs>